Welcome to Big People, Mini Bios. My name is Yuli Tsimbal, and on this podcast, I cover the mini biographies of influential, world-changing individuals. Stick around to get encouraged and inspired. In this first episode, I'll be covering the life of one of the most influential and powerful voices in human history, a man whose impact on the world is hard to rival to this day. He preached to over 10 million people in his lifetime and to many millions more in his death through his written works. Known around the world as the Prince of Preachers, his name is Charles Haddon Spurgeon. Today, there is more material available written by Spurgeon than by any other Christian author living or dead. In fact, the collected works of his sermons fill 63 volumes. And if you want to get an idea of how many that is, the millions of words contained in his works are equivalent to the 27 volumes of the Encyclopedia Britannica in one of their editions. All that being said, this episode will obviously not cover all the amazing things Charles Spurgeon has accomplished but it will hopefully give you enough of a window into his life to give you a glimpse into this incredible servant of God and inspire you. Charles Spurgeon was born into a poor family on June 19, 1834, in a small village in England. He was the eldest of 17 children, only eight of which survived infancy. When he was just about a year and a half, uh, one and a half years old, he was sent by his mom and dad to be raised by his grandparents. No one knows exactly why his parents sent him there, but one thing is for sure. This environment would serve as that foundation that would make Charles Spurgeon into the man the world knew then and still remembers today. Because it was here, in his grandfather's home, that he discovered a pastor's library. His grandfather kept an extensive collection of Puritan theology, The young Charles Spurgeon would often take these classics up to an attic loft and spend countless hours in the company of John Owen, Richard Baxter, and especially John Bunyan. In fact, Spurgeon first read Bunyan's book, The Pilgrim's Progress, when he was only six years old, and he would go on to read it over a hundred times throughout the rest of his life. The Pilgrim's Progress, if you don't know anything about it, uh, was at one time second only to the Bible in its popularity. It's massively popular. If you don't own a copy of this book yet, you should get one. It's an amazing allegory for the Bible. These books prepared Spurgeon theologically for the pastoral role he would step into in only a short matter of years. An interesting event occurred when Charles Spurgeon was slightly older. When he was about 10 years old, a visiting missionary named Richard Nill stayed with his family for a few days. Richard spent three days with the young and eloquent Charles to teach him about Jesus through many stories. He prayed with Charles that Charles would know and serve the Lord. At the end of their time together, the visiting missionary said that the young Spurgeon would one day preach the gospel to thousands and would preach in Roland Hill's chapel, which was at that time the largest dissenting church in London. His words were later fulfilled. As a brief aside here, I think it's really important to state that we should never underestimate the power and potential in a moment well spent with a child. For all you know, you may be speaking to a future Charles Spurgeon, C.S. Lewis, or Elizabeth Elliot. Spurgeon had no formal education beyond Newmarket Academy, which he attended from August 1849 to June 1850. But he was very well read in Puritan theology, natural history, and Latin and Victorian literature. All this just goes to show that much can be made from little. Don't ever doubt the efficacy of your own personal studies. They can amount to very much one day. In addition to his books, Charles Spurgeon was greatly influenced by the people he came across during his short years in school. One of the most influential people in his early development was Mary King. Interestingly enough, she wasn't even a teacher at Newmarket Academy. She was the cook. And yet, Charles said that he learned more from her than from his minister at chapel or any other master of divinity in his day. And I quote, She lived strongly as well as fed strongly. Mary Cook taught Charles Spurgeon strong doctrine, which later influenced his theology greatly down the line. 
Again, we should never doubt the importance of a moment well spent with a child. Spurgeon did try to pursue education beyond Newmarket Academy, but it didn't work out. He was going to have an interview with the principal of a theological college, but it never happened because he and the principal were accidentally sent to separate rooms for the interview. In the end, he never pursued formal education or ordination. And he said this helped keep him humble in his ministry. Amazingly, it also opened him up to the opportunities for preaching and pastoring that came shortly after this seeming mistake, which we'll get to in a moment. Now, knowing all this about Spurgeon, someone might be tempted to say that seminary shouldn't be a requirement for pastors. And while there most certainly may be exceptions, Charles Spurgeon proved to be a very rare exception. For instance, statistics show that today, the average U.S. pastor buys about four books a month. No word on how many books uh, are actually read, but about four books a month are purchased by U.S. pastors today. In his time, Spurgeon read six books a week. By the end of his life, his library had amassed over 12,000 volumes and many more that would have been in it had he not given books away. In short, if you were to compare the amount of sermons that Charles Spurgeon preached, which was 3,600 by the end of his life, to the amount of books that he read, the 12,000 books in his library, he read practically three books for every sermon he ever preached. His theological prowess would leave most seminarians in the dust. Again, Charles Spurgeon was a very rare exception. Now coming back to his boyhood years, Charles Spurgeon came to Christ when he was 15 years old. The way in which this happened is reminiscent of the way he missed his college interview. It was seemingly accidental or happenstance. One might say that many important moments in Spurgeon's life came about through sovereign detours like this one. He was on his way to an appointment, but a snowstorm forced him to seek warmer shelter in a church he'd never even been to of a different denomination than his, a primitive Methodist chapel. There, with only about 12 to 15 people present, he heard the gospel through a passage from Isaiah and finally believed. Apparently, his mother once said to him, Ah, Charles, I often prayed the Lord to make you a Christian, but I never asked that you become a Baptist. Spurgeon could not resist the temptation to reply, Ah, mother, the Lord has answered your prayer with his usual bounty and given you exceeding abundantly above what you asked or thought. Charles Spurgeon was always witty and is probably one of the most quotable people that ever walked the face of the earth. He grew up with his father and grandpa, both as preachers and both as pastors, but he didn't believe until his teenage years. This just goes to show that raising a child in the Lord is a community effort. All hands on deck are going to be needed. After he was baptized, Spurgeon moved to Cambridge, where he became a Sunday school teacher. Not long after that, Spurgeon preached his first sermon in 1851. He was practically tricked into preaching the sermon. An older man had asked Spurgeon to go to a little village, for a young man was to preach there who was not much used to services and very likely would be glad of company. It was only the next day that Charles Spurgeon realized the young man was himself. It would become his first affirming experience for his gift in teaching the Word of God. Spurgeon's first pastoral role came in a small church in the village of Waterbeach. He preached two consecutive sermons at Waterbeach Chapel and was asked to be the pastor. He was just 17 years old. His preaching at such a young age was so powerful and so creative that everyone wanted to come and hear this boy preacher. The Waterbeach Church went from 40 to about 450 in a matter of one to two years. The entire village began to change as the church grew. Drunkenness and thievery went down because the former drunks and thieves now attended his services. Waterbeach Chapel taught Spurgeon how to intimately care for the church before being called away to a bigger church with even greater needs. Spurgeon's calling to preach to the massive crowds in London materialized through an unlikely instance. He was overheard preaching in a Sunday school by a man with connections to New Park Street Chapel. This was a really big church in London with a remarkable history of renowned pastors. Shortly after his Sunday school lesson, Spurgeon received a letter inviting him to preach at New Park Street. Charles, being so young, thought there was some kind of mistake and they meant to invite some other Spurgeon. They had to actually convince him the letter was meant for him. It's amazing what God can do 
with men who are faithful even in the smaller roles that he gives them, much like the Sunday school role for Charles Spurgeon. It's interesting that he wasn't invited to preach at New Park Street after having been heard as the pastor uh, of Waterbeach Church, but instead after being heard as a Sunday school de- uh, lesson deliverer. Now, Charles was initially resentful of being called by God to serve in London. It had lots of people and many smells. But most saddening to his heart were the orphans that were littered throughout the streets. However, these orphans later became the inspiration for one of his most passionate ministries. Within just four months, New Park Street Church decided they wanted Spurgeon to stick around. He was just 19 years old when he became their pastor. Before he was 20, Spurgeon had preached over 600 times. At 22, he was the most popular preacher of his time. He was known for preaching in a personal, clear, and forceful language, which was uncommon in his day. And he continued preaching to the New Park Street congregation for the rest of his life, even through their various church expansions and new buildings. It had to have been God's timing that Spurgeon arrived in London when he did. In, in the 1850s, there was a huge population shift from the country into the city. Spurgeon was able to speak to these people in a way they could relate to because he himself was from the country. He spoke in a language the common person could understand. He was in the right place at the right time to be used as God's instrument for a movement. When Charles Spurgeon first came to New Park Street Church, it was small and decaying in spite of its famous history. It had only about 200 members when Spurgeon first preached there. But before long, the church was bursting beyond its capacity of 1,200 people and a more spacious meeting location was needed. The church moved to Exeter Hall, where the main hall's auditorium could hold more than 4,000 people. But even this building proved to be too small to contain everyone that was eager to hear the Word of God faithfully preached. So the next move was a temporary meeting place at the Surrey Musical Hall. This was a secular venue, which meant that many non-religious types could feel comfortable attending there, and as great as that was, uh, it still got Spurgeon a lot of flack for selecting a secular venue for sacred services. This was one of many criticisms he received over his life, uh, which you're going to hear more about in just a moment. This place uh, held 10,000 people inside, and as many as 10,000 more gathered outside of this venue to try and hear Spurgeon preach his first sermon there. Unfortunately, what was meant to be the first grand session at this hall turned into tragedy. Someone falsely cried out, fire, causing a giant stampede as thousands of people rushed out, causing many injuries and seven deaths on the way. Spurgeon was haunted by this event for the rest of his life, and it led to much of his depression. There were times he couldn't pray, delight in his Bible, and so on. In fact, this event almost single-handedly ended his ministry. Ironically, the bad publicity that it garnered actually caused more people to come hear him preach the next time at the Surrey Musical Hall. (laughs) This was yet another way in which God used his suffering for good. Spurgeon believed that Christian ministers should expect a special degree of suffering to be given to them as a way of forming them for Christlikeness, and he certainly had his fair share of that suffering in his ministry. On October 7th, 1857, he preached to his largest crowd ever, 23,654 people at the Crystal Palace in London. It's reported that after preaching to this crowd, he slept for for 24 hours straight. A much-deserved holy nap for sure. You can imagine the force it required to preach to such a crowd without any modern voice amplification. He preached to over 20,000 people without a microphone or any speakers. Spurgeon's congregation finally found their permanent home in a building that they built in Southwark, London. It was the largest church building of its day. He frequently spoke to over 10,000 people week in and out without a microphone. John Piper joked that this is probably why he died early. You can imagine all the force that it took to speak to that many people. Charles was often brought low because of the honor and the weight of preaching to so many people. This just goes to show that having the following of thousands is not really that appealing, but a responsibility that few can bear well. As big as his church was, The Spurgeon Center reports that Charles Spurgeon knew all 6,000 church members by name, something that his photographic memory probably helped him with. Now up until this point, I haven't quite yet mentioned Spurgeon's wife, Susanna. This would be a pretty fitting place to introduce you to her now. 
as Spurgeon met her when he moved to London and started pastoring there. Funny enough, it was not love at first sight. Susie initially found Charles's accent to be an affliction and his preaching unimpressive. She found the way that he dressed distasteful and shoddy. Talk about a closed door to a relationship. Despite these obstacles, the young pastor's sincere and genuine care soon broke through Susanna's walls. She had doubts in her faith at the time that she met Charles. When he found out that she wanted to grow more in her faith, he offered her a copy of one of his own favorite books, The Pilgrim's Progress. They quickly became friends and before long fell in love. Susie and Charles married in 1856. Susanna later gave birth to twins, Charles and Thomas. Thomas would become the pastor of the Metropolitan Tabernacle after Spurgeon passed away. Throughout much of their life, Susanna was confined to her home because of a chronic illness. Charles cared for her regularly, and when he later became sick, she cared for him. She was often unable to attend church alongside Charles or even interact with their congregation due to her illness. However, this didn't stop her from serving. Susanna was a big influence and support in Charles's life. Spurgeon would call, as he would say, his wifey to come and help him on, a sa- on Saturday afternoons. Together, they would read commentaries and discuss the scripture for the next day's sermon. If he was too discouraged to read, Susanna would read to him. Susanna also counseled women and girls in the church and assisted female candidates at baptismal services. Susanna also later inspired one of her church's ministries. After proofreading the first volume of her husband's book, Lectures to My Students, she recognized that many poor pastors in England had a need for solid books with rich theology. This realization led her to start Mrs. Spurgeon's Book Fund, which provided books free of charge to needy ministers all over the country. Throughout her life, she distributed hundreds of thousands of books, filling the shelves of poor pastors. By her death, 200,000 volumes had been sent out. Even after the death of her husband, Susie was still actively engaged in Christian work. Not only did her book fund continue, but she gave herself to the work of church planting in the final years of her life. Once, when passing through a coastal town, she couldn't find a Baptist chapel where she could worship, so she helped plant a church there. You can see how Susanna was a great match for Charles Spurgeon. If you want to learn more about her life, you can look up her biography titled Susie, written by Ray Rhodes Jr. In addition to Susie, Spurgeon's own schedule helped keep him moving and serving. Every week he preached four to ten times, read six meaty books, revised sermons for publication, lectured, edited a monthly magazine, wrote his own books, and spent time Sabbathing with his family. What a disciplined and well-lived life. With this well-refined schedule, Spurgeon was able to tackle many ministries. One of those ministries was an orphanage. Seeing a lot of orphans throughout London, Spurgeon was moved to start an orphanage. After praying that God would provide the means, a Christian woman with a great inheritance donated her money and time to start the Stockwell Orphanage. It's actually still active today and is now called Spurgeon's Children's Charity. Another one of Charles Spurgeon's ministries was the Pastor's College, which he founded in 1857 with the intent to give opportunities for training to persons with little academic background. It's still around today and has been renamed Spurgeon's College. And one of the biggest ministries of Charles Spurgeon's was, of course, preaching. Um, According to Lecture 6, Volume 1, Charles Spurgeon confessed that the hardest part of sermon preparation for him was selecting a text. He said, I confess that I frequently sit hour after hour praying and waiting for a subject, and that this is the main part of my study. Charles Spurgeon, uh, with as many sermons as he preached, still struggled, probably sounds like almost every sermon, to find a topic uh, for that Sunday or for that day. He wrote his sermons out fully before he preached, but he only carried a note card with an outline sketch up to the pulpit. His photographic memory certainly helped out with this. Spurgeon used a decent bit of humor in his sermons, and when he was challenged by one lady on injecting uh, humor into the delivery of God's word, Spurgeon responded by telling the lady, if only she knew how much he held himself back. He never gave altar calls after his sermons, but he always extended an invitation to anyone with an interest in Christ to meet him on Monday morning. And without fail, there was always someone at his door the next day. Fun fact about Charles Spurgeon's ministry of preaching is that his preaching even inspired a young and aspiring artist to become a preacher before he fully devoted himself to the art that he later became known for. The artist was Vincent Van Gogh. 
Spurgeon had a, his own style for doing things. He did things very differently from a lot of the ministers in his day. He preached gospel-rich sermons in the language of the common person, rejecting the more traditional and high-flowing, flowery style of his day. Spurgeon also had some unique practices even for Baptists, like appointing elders to serve alongside him. He also preached against slavery, which earned him the disapproval of some listeners and publishers in his day. He was often heckled by the media during his ministry. Many articles and comics portrayed him negatively. The media was harsh on him for standing up for truth. For example, he stood up against the teachings of Darwin, which were published during his lifetime, and against the influence of Darwin's teachings in the church. For this, the media portrayed him as a guerrilla. Sometimes the newspapers were so cruel that his wife Susanna would hide his daily paper from him to prevent him from seeing what they said about him. He was even vilified by Baptist ministers who were taking a more liberal approach to the scriptures. His stance against Darwinism and the loose interpretations of scriptures that were going around uh, were all part of what became known as a downgrade controversy. Other times, he was accused of being irreverent by other ministers for speaking in such a relatable and simple way. He was pressed from all sides with opposition. When he started preaching in England, the papers described him as an actor strutting up and down his platform, speaking in a coarse way about holy things. These papers predicted he was merely a comet, a quick flash in the pan, only meant to last a moment before fizzling out. Boy, were they wrong. Looks like nothing has changed about the media since that time. It always has been relentless, even to the most gracious and holy of people. Anyone doing ministry and receiving flack for it can find some encouragement to go on through the example of Charles Spurgeon. He pressed on and preached the truth no matter how unpopular it was. Spurgeon actually had an entire lecture at his pastor's college devoted to turning a deaf ear and a blind eye to certain criticisms. No doubt, this is what it took for him to not slow down in the constant onslaught of opposition. Charles Spurgeon attributed all of his success to the prayers of his people and the grace of God. He died at the age of 57 after 38 years of preaching. By the time of his death, he was personally involved in 66 ministries. So like I said, this episode barely even scratches the surface of what he did. Someone once analyzed his ministries and remarked that it could have taken 50 separate men to run them, yet somehow Spurgeon managed to do it. He was a powerhouse of energy. Very few could accomplish what he did. He was known all throughout the globe. His sermons could be found among Christians in China, coffee farmers in Sri Lanka, and fishermen in the Mediterranean. People all the way from California to New Zealand had something in common that they could discuss if they ever met. Charles Spurgeon's writings. It's been calculated that with all the money Charles Spurgeon's sermons, books, and other endeavors made, he could have died a millionaire. But he gave most of his money back to the church and to other ministries. Spurgeon would be rolling in his grave if I did this entire episode on him without mentioning even once the gospel he preached. After all, he did say, let my name perish, but let Christ's name live last forever. So here's another quote from him on the gospel he preached. I have nothing else to rely upon but the fact that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, lived, died, was buried, rose again, went to heaven, and still lives and pleads for sinners at the right hand of God. This quote is as true now as it was then. Charles Spurgeon loved the lost and he pursued the unbeliever with all of his heart. That's why his works are shared and read even by those who disagree with his theological stances because they know that he had a heart bent on saving the lost. And with that, any believer can agree. If you want to learn more about Charles Spurgeon, you can look up some of, his docu some of the documentaries about him on YouTube, uh, like The People's Preacher or Through the Eyes of Spurgeon, both of which I really enjoyed watching. Uh, there's also his autobiography, written, of course, by himself, or my favorite book of his, Lectures to My Students, where you can, uh, listen, uh, where you can read his lectures on preaching. He also um, uh, has 63 volumes of sermons. You can find those, or you can read The Forgotten Spurgeon by Ian Murray, which is a focus on the controversies that Spurgeon battled with through his life. Thank you so much for tuning in to the very first episode of Big People Mini Bios. The next episode will be the mini biography of one of the most intellectual, one of the intellectual giants of the 20th century, and arguably one of the most influential writers of his day. Till next time.